Okay, hey everyone. Welcome to another edition of SciComm in the COVID-19 era. And we're super excited to have Kate Breadbenner with us today. Correction, Dr. Kate Breadbenner. <laughs> and uh, the point of these discussions, uh, we, we get to explore and engage with SciCommers that are working in this time, uh, this pandemic time. And we want to know what they're doing, how they're doing it, uh, where they're doing it, and you know, even why too, if we can get there as well and get a perspective of the future, the challenges they're, they're, they're experiencing. So, uh, and today we're super honored to have Kate and I'll let her uh, tell us a little bit about herself and then we'll dig deep into some of the initiatives that she's done so far in the COVID-19 era. Dr. Birdbenner, welcome. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm Dr. Kate now, woohoo. Um, so I uh, went through the whole virtual defense thing. I'm part of that whole uh, group of people all across uh, the entire world now that does not get a graduation because uh, of coronavirus, but um, it's great to be so connected virtually. Uh, and, I, and I think we're gonna, in some ways, learn a lot about how to stay connected with people around the world that we didn't have before. Um, but yes, I uh, recently received my PhD from Rockefeller University in New York. So, you know, I'm at America ground zero for <laughs> coronavirus work. Um, and uh, right now I'm kind of in that transitionary period where um, I'm moving from the research that I did with my PhD, which was all on HIV-1. Uh, and now I'm looking for new positions. Um, so I'm also part of that uh, whole community of people that are looking for a job in the time of coronavirus. So um, yeah, it's never too far from my mind with my virology training, but also with my life transitions at the moment. Uh, so yeah, that's bringing me in. Um, but I also work in SciComm. So I run a YouTube channel called Simple Biologist that takes new papers um, published from the world of biology and turns them into fun animated videos. These videos are generally designed for adults without science careers, but they're basically appropriate for anybody that knows about cells or, you know, DNA. So anyone from middle school age up. Um, and I animate them myself and um, put them out there for the world to see. So yeah. Nice. Fun nice. To hear. That is so cool. Um, so tell us a little bit, I'm so I, I'll say this, that we should probably have you back at some future point to discuss your own career trajectory, because I know I think uh, it's yes. you know, <laughs> the fun discussion. Ooh, so fun. Yeah, I've, uh, yeah, it's always fun to talk about all the things that you can do with a PhD, because a lot of people start uh, the PhD program and think, yeah, I'm going to be a PI, and then realize, you know what, maybe this isn't for me, and then, you know, have that crisis moment of what am I going to do? But there's so many options out there. So it's always great to hear from people that have gone through, made their own way um, and found their own path. So, yeah. but for another day. <laughs> uh, see it, see it. Okay, so Simple Biologist. Um, so you actually recently put out a video, a COVID-19 video, I believe, right? Uh, on yeah. The, tell us a little bit more about what your efforts have been in that space so far. Yeah, for sure. So um, coming from kind of the virology background from studying HIV uh, and for making these videos for, you know, over three years now, um, I was scared of coronavirus. Um, like a lot of my friends had anxiety, my lab shut down, you know, I was at home. Um, and a lot of the messaging out there about it was about how to not get it or how to not spread it, right? Which is... Um, a little bit different than how it actually works and how the virus actually works and how it makes you sick and what cells is it infecting all of these kind of specifics i i felt like were missing because the main message is you know wash your hands stay away from people wear a mask which is all really really great information but it doesn't it didn't help me feel better or feel like i had a better handle on what this virus even was um so I thought, okay, well, let's make a video on that. That's the kind of stuff that I do uh, all the time is, is look at the molecular level and see, okay, how does this stuff work? Yeah. Um, so I read about coronaviruses in general because they're a whole family of viruses where, where COVID-19 and um, I guess SARS-CoV-2 is the specific virus name, right. um, where that's only one type of coronavirus. But... Um, there's a lot of coronaviruses that cause the common cold every year or that are um, 
kind of a big problem in livestock. Uh, like if you're a farmer or, you know, anything like that, you know, coronaviruses are something that you're aware of. Um, but because they're a big family, they, they all have a lot of stuff in common. So I read um, quite a few papers on, on, you know, the virology of, of coronaviruses, what they do, you know, how they function, what kind of genome do they have, what kind of proteins do they make, you know, how do they make more of themselves. Um, and then turned that all into a video on how do coronaviruses work in general. And then if you know how they work in general, then we can see what's different about SARS-CoV-2 that's causing COVID-19 and see, okay, what was the change here? Because I think that's um, part of what people are looking into to try to figure out new treatments or you know, even vaccines are what's different about this virus now than all the other coronaviruses that we've ever seen before. Um, so yeah, it was, um, I mean, I hate to say it was a lot of fun. It was a little anxiety inducing to like read the word coronavirus over and over again, but it made me feel better. Um, kind of understanding the virus, understanding how it works, understanding, you know, why people would go into respiratory failure because it does infect the, the cells that line the bronchial tubes and you know, it does cause a lot of inflammation and that inflammation isn't always great for breathing. Um, yeah. So, you know, it made me uh, feel a little bit more empowered in my understanding of this virus, um, which I hope then translated to any of my audience members or anyone that watched the video that they feel like, you know, it's not just this scary nebulous thing that's out there that they can actually understand and, you know, incorporate how the virus actually works. I find it interesting that you, you use your internal motivation, right? Your own drive, like you say, I, I want to know these things as well, right? And you're yeah. it's by training as well, right? Mm -hmm. so from a really, you know, detailed insight in a way, right? Yeah. Uh, which I think is really, really cool. So <laughs> your audience, would you say, what were you targeting this video? Yeah, so, I mean, in some ways I'm my own audience, <laughs> um, which is kind of funny, so I, I mean, I try to make these videos with me, my friends, my family in mind. You know, what do we like? What do we think is funny? Like, what are, what are the videos that you watch on YouTube that you can't get enough of? Um, you know, what do I want to know? What are my friends asking about? What is my family asking about? Because I, um, <clears throat> I come from a family of non-scientists. Um, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. I'm uh, the first person in my family to go to college, let alone become a doctor. Um, so, you know, I've got that sense of what's missing from the news or from, you know, a, a daily discourse that those kinds of people might want to know. Um, so I tend to focus on adults that, that just don't have science careers, but I treat everyone as if they're smart because they are, right? And like nobody's nobody can't understand the information that you're telling them. It's just, usually this isn't the kind of information that makes it into the news because it's, you don't necessarily need to know it to be safe, but I find it very reassuring to know these things, to know how something works makes me feel better about it rather than for it to be a mystery. Okay. Um, the audience is, I guess, adults in a way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, broader sense. Yeah. Uh, and um, in, in a way, like you've made how many videos so far? Ooh, how many videos have I made? Probably over oh. 20, at least over, uh, um, oh. but not on coronavirus. I've made one video on coronavirus specifically. So do you plan to make more uh, on COVID-19 or? Yeah, so that's the question. Um, so YouTube right now is doing something rather unique in that they are not promoting any videos or suggesting any videos that seem to have anything associated with coronavirus, COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, pandemics, anything like that, um, because there are so many videos that are misinformation. Right. Um, so, I mean, I shared my video among my network and obviously my subscribers get a ping um, when I created the video. But I think, um, in the future, you know, if we if we find a treatment that is extremely effective, or we find a vaccine, or you know, anything of the sort, um, I would want to make a video on that. Okay. Um, but I think for now, 
having the information about how coronaviruses work. Um, and I feel like in some ways, any video I make would be outdated almost immediately because everyone is working on this thing. Um, so, you know, we find information one day and by the time I make a video in, you know, three days or so while I fit it in between my work, uh, you know, it's already like, oh yeah, we've known that forever. Here's the new stuff, right? Um, so, I, you know, I think in the future when, when people are calmed down and they want to know, you know, okay, now this vaccine is out there, you know, how, how does that work? Like what, I know how coronaviruses work from your last video, but you know, how does the, how does the vaccine or the treatment or, or whatever, you know, we end up with, um, how does that fit in? Um, that might be a video that I would be interested in making too. And you make a good point. Things are changing so rapidly, right? Yeah. You, and, and I'm curious for your first video, I mean, things you put on there, I mean, are they still valid in a way? Like this is how it works and, and you know, is this still true now? <laughs> and how do you navigate that space where things are gonna change? You put something out now and how do you communicate that to your audience? Yeah, so that was part of the reason why I chose to make a video as broad as I did. Mm -hmm. So I made it about the coronavirus family, mm -hmm. right? So these are fundamental facts about what it means to be a coronavirus and fit into this whole family of viruses. So those are facts that are not ever really going to change because if those facts change, then it's no longer a coronavirus. It's something you know, totally different. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that video is going to maintain consistency, but anything that you make about, um, you know, about possible drugs and how they work or, you know, um, any, anything that is kind of an up and coming treatment or anything like kind of medically associated or anything that is very preliminary on how SARS-CoV-2 is different from any of the other members of the coronavirus family. All of those things are kind of in flux right now as we reach a scientific consensus. Um, because, you know, not all research, you know, is 100%. We need, we need a consensus around things. Maybe someone finds something and then it can't really re reproduce anywhere else. So, you know, we need to all work together to find out, you know, exactly what's different here and exactly what's gonna work. Right. Um, so that's a dangerous place to be in for a communication unless you're doing these constant really quick updates. Like it takes a while to make a video that's going to be of good quality and that, and that you want to put out. Um, but I've seen some very good Instagrammers who, um, you know, put out on their stories. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that you can do kind of very quickly to say, you know, hey, I read this paper you know, let me, let me just give you a quick summary on it and what people are thinking. It's a little bit different than going through and illustrating a video and, and recording all of those things. It's more of a, of a snappy, quick update kind of thing. Right. Um, so it really depends on the medium of communication that you're working in as to how much you're on the, on the front line explaining all of these new findings that are coming out versus um, what I do is kind of give the baseline of, you know, here's what we know on the molecular level about this whole family. Right. Um, and that's going to be true for whether you're looking at SARS-CoV-2 or, um, you know, any of the SARS viruses from the past, MERS from the past, you know, it's, it's true for all of them. And I think that's really cool because we, we had Siva, our last guest, who was talking about tackling misinformation. You know, so she's based in India and, you know, the WhatsApp groups where they're popping up all these theories and so yeah. what's on the grow where they're okay this is let's try to debunk this thing so it's like yeah. on the spot let's get a, an expert to come in and then you have also uh we have the ceo of uh, uh sigma xi who came in and was talking about having to go back on their videos that they put out to the community and updating them yeah. and it's actually celebrating the idea that we should that that aspect of science right that's that it's updating right yeah. it's actually a good thing yes <laughs> uh, for sure so it's really cool to see the different levels that each of you the sidecomers if you will that are tackling this uh, problem and by my understanding what you just said you're mm -hmm. at the high level where you know these things what you're communicating essentially are the the the, the almost like the laws or the coronavirus in, right yeah that are most likely not going to change but they need to be communicated so people understand mm-hmm 
what that is. Um, so, so that's actually fascinating. So you're looking to to continue that uh, direction, like this um, education, you will, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I mean, in all the videos that I make, usually what I do is I take a, a new paper, a new finding, something that's come out that's, you know, changed our worldview in some way. Um, but most of the video is usually explaining how the world was before this finding even occurred, right? Like, you know, if you're going to talk about a, a new kind of, um, what, like a new piece of the translation machinery, if you're going to talk about the ribosome, right, then you've got to, you know, explain all of that, you know, what's going on here, what does the world look like, how does this fit in, and then, ooh, they found this new little piece. I always try to emphasize that, you know, like you said, science is updating, it's changing consistently. I mean, there are things that are always going to be true, but then there are more and more things that we add to it to clarify the picture. Right. Um, like we, we don't have a clear picture of how every single thing in the universe works. Um, but we do know, you know, certain bare facts on how things work. Um, that, you know, DNA is translated into RNA, is made into protein, and sometimes there are some exceptions there. But, but you know, that's, that's generally the mode on how things work. Um, so, you know, emphasizing that, yes, there are things that we know because of scientific consensus, but then people are constantly adding in new information to clarify our picture there. Um, and I think we're seeing it in action with coronavirus. Uh, people aren't usually following something this closely, and people aren't usually working this much on just one topic. So we're seeing kind of this process that would normally take, you know, years, maybe decades, um, happen in such a rapid period of time where, you know, one group puts out some information about this drug and another group is like, hey, I wasn't really able to reproduce that, but we found this other thing. And then a third group is like, oh yeah, we, we weren't able to reproduce the other thing either, but we, we confirm with you, right? Um, and, and usually, you know, that's a drawn out process because there's not so many parties involved but, but now many people, um, even here at my university, uh, Rockefeller, have, have pivoted to working on, on coronavirus because we need it. Um, so, so this is giving, I think, a lot of people a very in-depth view of how science is done that I, that I generally try to emphasize in my videos, but it's on a totally different time scale. Uh -huh. um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Press. Do you, so this is always a hard question for people. How do you assess impact for your work? Yeah, so um, it's something that I've struggled with for a while because um, the simple biologist videos that I make, uh, I make on my own. So I don't have like a team that works with me. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm very busy, uh, like I kind of had to take the last year off to be able to finish my PhD. I was just in the lab a lot and very focused on, on writing everything. So I, I didn't have the flexibility of time that I had, you know, even two years ago, three years ago to be able to make more videos. Um, and I felt pretty bad about that for a while that like, I had built this thing and I had built subscribers, but then, you know, I wasn't able to take the time to make the videos because, you know, I was in the lab late at night, right? Right. Um, and so you kind of have to define what it means to be successful. And I think, um, I think it can be hard with the internet being the way that it is, where everything's a numbers game. Like, how many likes did you get? You know, like, oh my gosh, you got a thousand likes? Like, that's crazy. Um, I'm only here getting like 10 likes. And it's easy to forget that each one of those things is a person that you impacted. Right. And so, you know, if I impact five people with a video that I made, that's still five people. Like, if they were here in a room with me, that would feel incredible. Um, Whereas on the internet, it feels very abstract and you look at five and you're like, oh, only five. Um, so when you, when you look at the numbers of how many people watch or interact with the things that you're putting out there, you, I think it's hard to stop and think, yes, each one of those things is a person who you know, has more information now and can feel more empowered to make good decisions or, or, or different decisions or even the same decision 
uh, that they would have made before. But I mean, you helped them with that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you look at, uh, you know, maybe a thousand views on a video and you think that's a thousand people. If we put a thousand people like in a room with you, like that would be nuts. Right. So um, I think it can easily be discouraging for new YouTubers, new, um, new people on SciComm, especially in the social media sphere, um, to feel discouraged about how many people are looking at their, at their stuff. But, um, yeah, getting that, getting that grounded sense of, uh, yes, these are people, <laughs> um, not just numbers is, is really helpful for that. I think sometimes, you know, you wonder, you, you get the, likes and the views and so forth right and then at times i always wonder but then how do you really know whether someone has um, learned let's say from your video for example you do talk about the biology of the coronavirus mm -hmm. really understand those intricacies right um yeah to go further and say could i pull my uh do a little quiz or something i don't know like do you wonder about that aspect as well right? especially now with COVID 19 are people understanding the things that you're communicating how do you know <laughs> yeah yeah um so that's that's something that's a little harder to do because then you need people to actually you know opt into a quiz and you know everyone hates pop quizzes like i don't want anyone to just like suddenly quiz me right um, but as part of my PhD, I was um, able to do a little bit of science communication research. Okay. Fantastic. I have like a, a very, very understanding PI who understands that science communication is an integral part of the scientific process, which, you know, is incredible. Right. So I brought up with him the idea of looking at the effectiveness of different ways to summarize science. Mm. So that included videos like the kinds that I make, but also these uh, so-called plain language summaries where you summarize a paper, but you only use, you know, common words. You don't use the crazy jargon that the scientists are using. Um, and I also looked at graphic uh, summaries and then compared them all to the original abstracts that are put out with every publication. Um, and this was a quiz. Um, so people, you know, looked at the different summaries um, and then would answer the same questions um, afterwards. Uh, and then they would also rate, you know, how much did you enjoy looking at this? How confident do you feel that you understand the research? after seeing this. Um, and for both video and for um, the plain language summaries, people did very well on the quiz, um, but even, but the videos, people generally felt more confident in their understanding, mm. seeing a video versus reading something. Uh, and I think there's something to that, especially for molecular biology, for things that are small, things that you can't see to be able to put a visual to those, I think helps people with their understanding of, of then what you're telling them rather than just reading something like, how do you imagine a protein? If that's not something you do on a daily basis, you don't really. Um, so having a little video where, you know, I draw the protein, even if it's just a little blob, then you're like, haha, that's the protein, okay. Um, so it was cool to see that research come out um, and for it to kind of match up with how I had been thinking about it. Um, because you never know, like I'm a single person, right? Maybe I just like really love video and, and it's actually not very helpful. And if it wasn't very helpful, then I don't want to keep making videos. I want to do what people are going to connect with. Right. Um, but they do seem to connect with video. Um, and from the quiz, I mean, they do seem to actually get the, the baseline facts from videos. Um, and then another way that you can tell is often, you know, people will share it or they'll say, you know, good things or like, oh yeah, I really understood that. Um, or like, I've been trying to understand this topic and it's been really challenging, but this video really helped. Right. Uh, and you kind of have to take them at their word, right? That, that they do feel like it helped. Um, so in the end, I mean, it's definitely important for people to have information, but it's also important for people to feel like the science community is supporting them. Right. Because that's the point, right? We, we, in science, we want to support people and our understanding of the world. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe in a year from now, you know, they won't 
understand, you know, how, what, what protein the coronavirus makes to do this, but they, they'll understand that, yeah, we've got a handle on this, you know, we know what's up. And if at any time you want to go back and get a refresher, this stuff is going to be here for you. Right. Um, right. So, and it's just yeah. The power of your video as well as standing that test of time that, you know, and I yeah. think I like the idea that you're doing these, um, animations right and and i know i know we didn't get into great detail about how you do them and so forth and but you mentioned that you're a one person you know you're doing this all by yourself and Damn. that's one challenge are there any other challenges uh that you can just briefly tell people like what what are what are difficulties in doing this uh one is by yourself anything else <laughs> yeah yeah um i think the other challenge is um figuring out what's worthy of a video it can be really tough. I mean, there are usually about 3 million academic papers per year or so, I think. Um, I think that's the number. Uh, I, I like kind of tried to grossly calculate it one day. Um, and I think it ends up being um, one paper every three minutes is published. It's a lot. Which is just a lot. Like, you know, even if you're in one very specific field, it can feel very daunting to keep up with every publication that comes out in your field. And that's something that I had a really hard time with studying HIV. Right. Because it is this global problem. A lot of people are working on it on many different levels on, you know, immunology, on on social, you know, how to how to prevent it. Um, you know, by, by communication and education, right. but then also, you know, on the structural biology level or on the molecular level, you know, there's so many papers that come out regarding HIV. So how do you sift through that? Um, and that's always really tough is identifying the gems uh, or, or the papers that you think are just so cool. Um, right. And, and, and that's part of, the way that I decide is, you know, did I read this, this paper and go like, wow, <laughs> um, you know, or, or, you know, did it make me so curious about stuff? Um, like I did a video once on the plant immune system. That's something I never thought before. Like plants, they can't social distance, they can't go anywhere. So like, you know, if your neighbor tree is infected, you, you're not going to be able to walk away from them. So how does the plant immune system even work? Um, and that was something that, you know, it's, it was just not part of my knowledge base at all. And I thought, well, if I have never thought about it, I'm sure a lot of people have never thought about it. And, you know, we've got plants in our house and we look outside and we love when it's green and spring is wonderful. So like, um, you know, that was, that was an easy choice to make uh, because it, instantly fascinated me. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I read, I, I like kind of cursorily read a lot of papers, um, mm -hmm. but I look for the ones that make me be like, huh, I never really thought about that. Or, ooh, I've been wondering about that for a while. Like, you know, how, how do bats use echolocation or, you know, all of these kind of cute little mysteries of the world that uh, um, kind of, fascinate me that's that is yeah, really sifting through that is is tough though because a lot of it's behind paywalls also which right. is its own separate problem so if i have a choice i try to choose an open access paper that way if people are really interested they like the video um and they want to go look at the paper they want to look at the figures um that they can mm. uh but i don't want to only do open access papers because they are open access. You can go find them. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have a university that pays for all of these journals. Um, so then if I make a video about it, then you don't have to feel like you're missing out and you need to pay $30 for the paper because I'm, I'm going to tell you what it says. Right. Um, right. right. So that's, that's another tough one is, is working through the publishing industry. Um, and it's something that I worry about for the future because um, I won't be at a university forever. I'm, uh, I'm transitioning into a new job. I might not have access to all of these journals at a different job. Mm. Um, so what does the future of simple biologists look like if I need to start paying $30 for each individual paper? 
um, maybe I will skew more towards the open access papers because, um, you know, that gets expensive really quickly if you need to pay just to be able to find out if you want to make a video about it. Right, right, right. That yeah. is indeed the economics have to make sense as well. <laughs> yeah. um, Dr. Brett Banner, this has been fantastic. Uh, we have barely scratched the surface. Here. <laughs> uh, for those who are listening, uh, I feel like this is just the, the staging. What we're doing here was the staging. <laughs> just to inform you um, what Simple Badge is all about, uh, Dr. Bredman's path uh, in science so far. She's just started getting started, you know. Um, and so we look forward to hearing more about what happens with Simple Biology and Science Biologist and, and what new videos you create. And I think I can tell you uh, we'll be very happy to try to help get the word out uh, as well. Um, uh, yeah, for sure. This has been a ton of fun. <laughs> Yes, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Um, for those listening, uh, thank you so much. We will share. Do you want to tell people sort of how do they get in touch with you? Twitter, uh, what are... You know? For sure, yeah. So I am on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and I also have the website, simplebiologist.com. And from there, you can contact me if you have an idea for a new video that you want to see or um, if you want to talk about anything further. I'm always available. Um, so YouTube, Simple Biologist, uh, they're, yeah. And you can also Google my name. I am, I'm on the internet. You'll find me. <laughs> it is on the internet. Um, uh, I did that too. So we'll put all those details in the info below on the YouTube once we post this. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Brebener. Yeah, thank you.